Hey, welcome back to the Franchisors.com summer tour. Uh, we're in week five. We've been going all across the country, but it's very good to be here in the city of brotherly love. We had a lot of really nice hospitality last night, got some full bellies at a steakhouse, and we're joined today by a couple of good friends in franchising. Mr. Dan Dizio is the founder of Philly Pretzel Factory, I guess I should say the name of where we're at, and then also Mr. Marty Farrell, who's the president. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining. Thanks. Glad to be here. Great. Thanks for having us, and welcome to Philadelphia. So we've got a set of 11 questions, uh, 11 topics that we're going to go down, but before we do that, would love for the folks, for the three people in the audience that haven't heard the story, or as the audience is growing, um, would like to hear the founding story, because I think it's an inspiring one. Yeah, so I, we're in Ben Salem, which is right outside of Philadelphia here. And uh, this is my hometown. My high school is only a couple hundred yards away from here, actually. And when I was 11 years old, um, playing in the backyard, my next door neighbor owned a pretzel bakery. And the way pretzel bakeries were before we came along, there was 10 of them in Philadelphia. And they all went and twisted pretzels all night long, 2, 3 in the morning. They would get in there. They would twist all the pretzels. By 9 o'clock, they typically closed their doors, and they would deliver those pretzels to schools and hospitals and different vendors around the city. And the same, these 10 guys were all fighting for the same businesses, mm-hmm. um, always battling each other. They would lose one. One guy would gain one. Um, and, again, my neighbor owned a bakery, and he had a son that worked for him. And he used to pay his son in pretzels. He used to give him 4,000 pretzels a day to work all night. And that son would take those pretzels and go and sell them. And one day he got stuck with a 1,000 pretzels. Um, I'm out back, and he uh, basically asked what I was doing that day. And I said, nothing. And, you know, in seventh grade, there's not much to do, you know, on uh, Saturday. And he said, how about I set you up on the street corner and sell these pretzels I got stuck with, and whatever you sell, we'll just split the money. And back then it was five for an hour. That was the going rate for pretzels. So I sold 1,000 pretzels that day. Um, so I brought in $200. He got $100. I got $100. And just to put it in context, my allowance was 3 bucks a week at the time. So that was nine months worth of allowance in one day. So I hit the gold rush. Um, so I was like, let's do it again um, the next day. And he really didn't even think about it that way. And he was like, okay, let's, I'll put you back out again. Um, and the crazy part of the story is that you know, I'm 11 years old, and before he let me do it, on the, put me on the corner, he said, I first have to ask your mom if it's okay. And for some reason, my mom said it would be okay to stand on Roosevelt Boulevard, <laughs> which I don't know if you guys know, but that's a 12-lane highway, one of the most dangerous highways in the country, actually. Mm-hmm. And to be able to sell it there, and I just can't even fathom it. But it was a different time back then, and you know, that's the, uh, it was just different for her to allow me to sell them, and it was a great opportunity for me. And once that started happening, I was selling every day. Uh, on the weekends and even after school. And by the time I'm three, four weeks into it, I was walking around school with a big wad of $1 bills and every kid in school wanted a job selling pretzels. And my job became the recruiter. I would organize kids and sometimes it was 50 kids a day, 45, 50 kids a day to stand on different corners. Um, and for that, he gave me a little extra money and I got to pick the best corner because the corners were certain ones were better. So you won the turf war. I won the turf (laughs) war. That would be it. And, uh, it kind of grew into something. I mean, uh, we're staying out there 12-hour days um, every day, all through the summer and everything. And eventually did all through high school and graduated um, high school, went on to college, um, was even doing it on college. I would come back on the weekends in college. And eventually it kind of phased out of it. Um, eventually graduated, became a stockbroker, and just didn't like my 9-to-5 job. Um, talked to my college roommate and said he wasn't happy with his. And I said, uh, why don't you quit and we'll open up a pretzel bakery. And we were planning on doing exactly what the old guys did before us, opening one pretzel bakery, um, open up, at, you know, going there at 3 in the morning, twist till mm. 9 and closing. Um, and the reason my partner really got involved in this was he was a golfer at the time. And he thought he could golf every day by 10 o'clock. And I said, sure, we'll be closed by 9. You'll be able to golf every day at 10. And we opened our first day. We actually ended up opening our retail street. And the only reason we chose that street was the rent was cheaper on that street than it was in a warehouse. Normally, all these pretzel bakeries were back in a warehouse. So we opened. We said, where do we care? We're going to be closed at 9 in the morning. And the first day we opened, uh, May 2nd, 1998, uh, there was a line at the door at 9 o'clock when we were technically going to close. There was 45 people in line. And uh, the line never went away till 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, I told Len to sell his golf clubs. We were going to stay open. And we were going to be a retail slash wholesale pretzel bakery. That was really sort of the plan once we had that first day. It would be a little bit both, but concentrate on the wholesale. That was really going to be our focus. The retail was just gravy. Um, but the retail kept growing every day. And we kept focusing on wholesale, but the retail kept growing. And 
I mean, it was sounds like a dream come true to have a line at the door your first day. I mean, we were not prepared for it. We didn't even have a cash register when we opened. That's how unprepared. Uh, we didn't think anybody was going to come in the store. Um, three months into it, though, dream come true or not, uh, we were sleeping on flower bags, 21-hour days, um, a nightmare. Like from a, a lifestyle standpoint, it was a nightmare. And in fact, so much so that Len, my partner, came to me and said, listen, this isn't what I signed up for. He said, here's the keys. You could just have it. Wow. He didn't even want the business. And he goes, I never dreamed we would do this well, but it's not worth it. And uh, I agree with him, but I mean, I loved it. I was passionate about the brand and, and pretzels at the time. And he was as well, but he just was like, this is no lifestyle. And we couldn't even envision a day where it was going to get any better. That was really the problem. We're, we're three months into it and we're going, it's only going to get, we're getting busier and busier. We're thinking it's going to get worse. How could it even get, we have no more time to give. And that's when we finally settled down and started to realize, let's hire some people we know, get them in there. And it's a lot harder to hire back in 1998. There wasn't Craigslist and there wasn't yeah. cell phones. Like it was hard to get a hold of people. Uh, it just wasn't right. People easily. today complain about how it's fragmented and everyone's everywhere. But back then it was. Uh, just I couldn't call people until yeah. nighttime because they were at work all day. They all had normal jobs, so I couldn't have a phone call with them until night. So what were some of those first hires? Like as you realized, oh, we obviously have something. What were some of those first hires and what was important on that kind of original team? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, we were really looking for bodies. I mean, we went and hired our college buddies. I guess on more that. appropriately. Maybe for Franchising, you maybe. Yeah, for our, for, for our audience, once you started franchising, I yep. guess we'll get into that. Once, yep. you, once you started, you buttoned up, you started franchising. Who are some of the kind of key early people and first hires on, on the team? Yeah, so we really, it was a, a two-man operation when we first started franchising, uh, me and Len. And we had one guy who worked for us who could be technically an ops guy. He worked in our store um, that helped us a little bit along the way as far as opening stores up. Um, but I think that's where really luck had, would have it. We, um, at the time, we started franchising in 2005, technically. It was really the beginning. And right around that time, uh, we start growing. We're selling franchises, which wasn't really the problem because it was a great concept. Everybody loved it. It was fresh and new. Um, and really, people weren't looking for the support yet, right? So it was mm -hmm. the honeymoon stage. They were like, I'm opening up. I'm busy. And then all of a sudden, they're asking us, where's all the support? And that's yeah. the part we didn't have, frankly. And we weren't even set up for it. We didn't even know what a franchise company really looked like because we hadn't been around it. Um, but eventually, we uh, a franchisee, um, one of our franchisees, used to work at Rita's Water Ice. And uh, introduced us to a bunch of people at Rita's um, over the years. And Marty, the president here, was one of the early guys, uh, probably one of the third, fourth right, guy here. And uh, he first, <laughs> well, we had a secretary. We had a we secretary did. before, and that's what it was. So a secretary and him and uh, met him. And I don't know what he was thinking, uh, leaving Rita's to come over because we didn't even have desk or anything. We had plastic folding tables. He'll tell the story. He showed up his first day and uh, – we didn't even greet him. There was no one to greet him. We just did, did, he walked in. He's like, "Is there anybody?" I'm not. Even, I don't even know who I'm supposed to talk to. Where do we I don't go? have computers. So uh, that was sort of the the first hire. But what was really nice about it is, we, me and Len create, I think, a good concept and a value based menu, um, and people fell in love with it. We had no experience in marketing and operations at all, and you can get so far with that first part of it, great mm -hmm. concept. But we really needed a structure and operations person. Um, and that's really where Marty came in. And when he came over, he, you know, realized, man, I mean, I think he, he, he downplayed it a little bit at the beginning, but he was probably overwhelmed the fact that we were so infantile in the, in the stage of really what's out there. We're just selling pretzels and that's all we're doing. And, and really Marty came on and that was a, a huge hire. Um, and I, I always tell the story because one of the first thing he came in, which I'm always, I've told this over, you may have heard me say this, is he comes in and we have a lot of needs. I even know that we have a lot of needs, but I don't even know where they are. And one of his first thing goes, we should hire a graphic designer. And to my mind was a graphic designer like seemed like so out of whack. And I got to tell you, it was one of the best things that we did because the one thing I've learned in franchising over the years is that the biggest value you can place on the company, a franchisor, I think from a franchisee perspective is the marketing aspect of it. They value it the most. It's the brand. Um, yeah. and, and it's the brand and engine. And we were able to get that in early and, and a gentleman named Teddy came on board and it really helped 
give us a brand identity and get us going in the right direction, I think we would have been in, we were in chaos anyway, but I think we would have been in a lot more chaos. And I'm sure Marty could add to that. Yeah. Any, anything else you would add to kind of that early team? Uh, by the way, totally agree, especially today when it's a fragmented world with all these different platforms and everything social media wise. So that's an interesting and wise, uh, like, first impactful hire what what would you say to that the ten of the early team yeah well Dan, Dan downplayed it even though he downplayed it a lot <laughs> <laughs> how much we really needed I mean we needed everything basically we had to start from scratch which was actually from my perspective the easy part mm -hmm. right because you know you, I knew what we needed so it was just a matter of going out and putting people in place and and bringing the right people on board so the early days you know we needed to have field support people we needed a training department we obviously like Dan said needed marketing support and marketing marketing people, and we had to create the culture around how do we go out and support franchisees. And once we started doing that and, ha and having franchisees see that we had support and systems behind them, that really sort of gave us a, a springboard to, to growth after that. We already saw real early growth because people were just excited about the concept, like Dan mentioned, uh, because it was new, it was something different. Nobody had taken, you know, Philly soft pretzels and made a brand around it mm -hmm. until Dan came along, really, um, and started this retail concept of buying soft pretzels. Like he mentioned, everybody, everybody in Philadelphia and everybody anywhere who bought soft pretzels bought them off of a street corner, out of a deli, out of a pizzeria or something like that. And they were cold pretzels because they were baked hours and hours ahead of time. So when Dan came along and by accident, again, because they were so busy, they were baking pretzels fresh and hot out of the oven. That really created this whole... Um, awareness about a different product. Um, so again, the excitement was there. We just needed to build the team and the support around uh, really growth and how franchisees and helping franchisees continue to grow the business and grow the model. And one thing I want to add to that. So right when we started franchising, um, you know, I had stores before I started franchising, I had about 10 stores before that. Um, and this is an important part to add to the team when we're talking about who you add and, and to add to the team and the value of it is there was a bunch of copycats that came along right when we were starting. And a lot of them sold pretzels with me on the street corners. Mm. Right? And there was a guy, at one point, there was four of us in the Philadelphia DMA that were pretty much the same exact size. We all had about 20 stores at the exact same time. Um, and we were really competing. And, and frankly, some of them had better um, maybe background in food service than me and Len did before Marty came along. Um, but the biggest thing that set us apart was we kept adding to the the employees here, to the culture, to the team, um, and franchisees saw that. So actually, what's crazy is some people said, oh, wouldn't you love it if those other three guys weren't even around at the time? Those three guys really helped us having competition um, because what happened is it created a, a this brand of pretzels, not our brand, but just in general, this, yep. this concept was out there and it almost gave validity to it. And what happened is they brought in people that were interested in their concept, not us, but they went they were going to buy a franchise from these competitors. We're all franchising. and But they were like, we got to do our due diligence. Let's go look at the competitors. And when they came in here, they saw, you know, we had a president. We had a training department. We had a marketing department. We had all these departments. Um, so that value to us, besides what they gave to our existing franchisees, was invaluable into the growth of us for the future. It's an excellent insight, and I love the way that you frame that. And some, if if you don't have competition, that's probably a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I want to get into another topic because you do things a little differently. You literally have a full size store right next door that we're going to go see. Um, first group of franchisees, talk about what those folks look like, and maybe how they change from early on uh, to, to later on. And well, I guess the early franchisees um, just believed in the concept, right? I mean, it, they didn't believe in the brand I, at the end of the day. I mean, the first guy who bought in, a, a gentleman named Jim Powers, was our first franchisee. And uh, he just believed in, we had this great product. Um, and where the change comes is that will get you so far. And there's no doubt we had a, a great product and it got us people to come to the door and create some interest. But as time grew Obviously, you need the support and the support those franchisees. And today, it's not just 
we're not just in Philadelphia anymore. So it's not where we just open the doors in Philadelphia. We're, we just opened up in Arizona. We have stores in Texas. We're opening all over. So it's imperative that we have the support to grow in these markets because it's, again, they might not even ever heard of Philadelphia, Philly Pretzel Factory, or Philadelphia Pretzels in general. Um, and their culture of pretzels just isn't the norm. In, in Philadelphia here, we wake up, eat them for breakfast. And, uh, you know, maybe Arizona, they're not used to it. Now, we always open and we always get the transplants of Philadelphians that go to these places. But we got it. We can't live off of that type of business. We got to grow the brand in those markets, and we have to get them to experience Philly pretzels the way we grew up on it here. So, and the franchisees are just have changed over the years from somebody who just wanted, you know, in some aspects a job and mm -hmm. it's something different to now true investors have gotten in with us um, to want to grow a portfolio. They have other brands in their portfolio they want to grow, and that's just completely different. And it has been a different shift from us having owner operators in all of our stores. Um, and that's one thing we do require. We want owner operators involvement. It doesn't mean they have to be in there twisting pretzels 12 hours a day, but we just need some involvement. Um, we're not a, we know that we're not a, a hands-off business. Yeah. We have to have involvement. Some businesses don't need as much. This one definitely does. So even the guys who have other portfolios, they really have to have a true system in place for general managers and managers in place for these stores to be successful. Marty, would you add any... Um what would you say were maybe some early pitfalls and and what do you think makes a good operator? Two questions there. So I, I think early pitfalls, I think most uh, and a lot of franchises, you know, go through this, right? They they don't do a lot of the pre-qualifications on the franchisees. Early days, you're excited, right? Mm -hmm. People are excited. They're excited about your brand. They're excited about, you know, growth. And you're excited also in those early days, especially, mm -hmm. right? You know, somebody is interested in investing, believes in you and has the will willingness to do it, you're like, okay. And that may be all your pre-qualifications mm -hmm. are, where now the, the pre-qualifications are more rigorous uh, to make sure that we're bringing in franchisees uh, that fit the culture you know, that, that we believe can work with us, understand what a franchise system is, understands, you know, that it's their business that they're going to have to go out and grow every day with our support. Um, you know, not necessarily people who are you know, to be honest, not overly entrepreneurial, right? Mm -hmm. People who are, yep. you know, really just follow a system. They want to grow and they want to grow the business. But at the end of the day, they realize they're following a the system um, and they're going to, you know, work with us on following the system to grow their business together. Yep. Um, I want to switch gears and talk about the differentiation of the product or uh, the product that you have. Um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, soft pretzels. Like how, 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 how have you, how do you differentiate that product from other folks on the market and comp com competition wise? Uh, well, I'll start, and then Dan can add to it since he has more experience with pretzels than anyone in the world. Uh, but the, you know, really, the Philly pretzel is different from what traditionally most people think of. When most people think of them, we go in new markets, they see a pretzel company coming, they think of the mall based pretzel, yep. right? And the mall based pretzel good product. It's just not a Philly pretzel. Uh, the mall-based pretzel is much more, we always, we kind of compare it to a, a donut shaped like a pretzel. It's usually mm -hmm. much more sweeter, uh, you know, the, the cinnamon and sugar, and, and that's really their hallmark product. Where a Philly pretzel, a little hard to describe, um, it, it's kind of like a Philadelphian, uh, crusty and salty on the outside, <laughs> and nice and fluffy and soft on the inside. As right? a Dallas guy, I would disagree <laughs> with the inside part, but that's so, funny. Well, that's what people believe, right? That's the difference. That you see our exterior, and that's what a soft pretzel, yeah. Philly pretzel is. It's just you know really sort of crusty. That's really the unique part of a of pretzel. Big grain to salt delicious and then again when you bite into a piece of it this really airy fluffy inside and that's uh, uh and the taste the taste is definitely unique um for a philly pretzel um compared to again the mall traditional pretzels most people are used to the shape is also different uh you know you're most people are used to the three ring uh pretzels what we call bavarian style our pretzels are are shaped like a paper clip um you know like a figure eight imagine that's the difference also in terms of shape they're also baked together our pretzels are baked directly on a stone um in, in an oven so you get that you know like you would a pizza mm. or, or bagels yeah. that are baked on a stone that's what you get from a, a traditional philly pretzel as well I'm getting hungry. Yeah, they're delicious also. Um, anything you want to add to that or next topic? No, I think the uh, one thing I would add is, is we're the true German pretzel. You know, the pretzel was 
started in Germany, and that's really where it came. A lot of the Germans migrated to Philadelphia. That's where it was born. So it's a true German pretzel that we have. And again, you know, I think Mario did a good job explaining the, the difference from a mall-based yeah. thing. But, you know, that's a, a constant battle for us when we open up to sort of distinguish ourselves from the mall-based thing. Um, and another part of it that's a big factor is the, the price for us. Our concept's more based on uh you know, there's a value to it, mm -hmm. but there's also really buying in quantity. That's a huge part of the business. I mean, those mall based businesses, again, we're not here to knock them. They're, they're, they've done a great job and great product, but people buy one and maybe their whole family s splits it up and tears on. Our customer comes in, buys 20, 30, 40 pretzels, brings them to the office, yeah. hundreds of pretzels to go to PTO meetings, to, you know, baseball leagues and stuff like that. So it's a, just a different concept than those mall based businesses. Yeah, switching gears to talk about unit economics, it's obviously very important to have a solid, strong business. Um, what are you measuring? How are you sharing it? And what's the importance of unit economics on the business? Well, it's very important, obviously. And it's very important for a franchise company, and it's very important that you communicate that to your franchise system mm -hmm. so that they all know where you're at. So, uh, you know, unit economics, and, you know, from a prospect standpoint, obviously we have a franchise uh, disclosure document, we have an item 19, so everybody who coming, is coming into our system has awareness of the unit economics on, the, mm -hmm. on a broad scale. And then in the system, once you're part of our system, we measure everything. So the KPIs that we look at are sales, like weeks up or down, average check, uh, percentage of wholesale business, percentage of party trade business, which is catering business, uh, the percentage of your labor, the percentage of your cost of goods, the percentage of your uh, mystery shop scores, the percentage of what we call operations performance reviews. That's what the okay. franchise support managers do. We measure all these things and we put them on a scorecard. And every franchisee in our system gets a copy of the scorecard and sees where they compare to the unit, uh, the system average on each and every one of those categories. And I probably missed one or two of those ca extra categories that because I don't have it in front of me. But we measure a lot and share a lot of that data with our franchisees so they can know where they stand and where they're at. Are they number one on the list? Or are they number 100? Because we think that makes a difference um, in, in maybe their motivation and in just their awareness. And hopefully that creates uh, some action uh, for them to change if they need to make improvements. Got it. Are you having them submit P&Ls in your aggregating or what? Uh, well, like most franchisors, it's required as part of the franchise Month agreement. Is it monthly or what is it? It's Well, we actually, we don't make them do it, okay. to be honest with yeah. you. Uh, we get a lot of that data already um, through our POS, yep, yep. Through, our, um, through our vendors, so all those KPIs yep. I just mentioned, we are able to get all that data ourselves, their own data analytics, and then spit that back out and give it back to the franchisees. Yep, anything else on unit economics you'd add? No, I mean, obviously, it's it's the key thing when you look at a business. I mean, at the beginning, I told you, you know, people got excited about pretzels, but the reality is now people want to know what they're getting into. It's a different investor, the way yeah. things are looked at upon it. And stores have to be profitable for systems to grow, right? I mean, you just can't have a business model where you just – our turnover cash, it has to be a profitable for other people to get involved in it and want to grow. And our franchisees, a lot of them are looking for other units. Um, that's a big part of it. And, you know, hopefully the reason is because they're doing well at one and they want more. But we realize it's the key part of the business because all the other stuff doesn't matter if they can't be successful at the store level. Got it. You know. um, franchise sales wise, because strong unit economics, uh, you mentioned that, that the investor kind of changed maybe from the early days. So curious on how your, your, your lead sources changed from maybe the early days um, and now uh, how the, the profile has changed a little bit. Well, I, I could speak on the early days. We did no really lead generation or anything. It mm -hmm. was just organic growth for us. People heard from a neighbor, a friend, a family member how some stores are doing well and they wanted to get mm -hmm. involved. They loved the brand. That was a lot of people. They loved Philly pretzels and wanted to grow. They sold them as a kid at their schoolyard or some way they felt tied into the brand. Um, so we got a lot of that. And once you started seeing stores pop up, um, where things have changed is when we started to grow outside of this region, yeah. it's a little different, right? We have to go and... Uh, you know, do we do franchise shows um, that just change the dynamic to try to expand? But as a whole, we still get a lot of organic growth and we still get people um, who are outside the market that grew up in Philadelphia that want to bring Philly pretzels because they know how special it is here, bring it to new markets. So we're not as driven and 
the last two years is where we got more into lead generation. And yeah. I think Marty can uh, add to that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll just add a little bit to the early days too. And, and just to, to sort of show you how things have changed. Um, Dan left out, we, uh, oh, in the very beginning, that. we used to take out small classified ads um, in the newspaper. Wait, what is that? <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> um, and that was our lead generation. It literally was a lead generation. It actually worked. Got a lot of leads from it. And that was it. That was the early days of lead generation. And people, you know, particularly in the Philly market, because that was mainly where we were growing or even considering mm -hmm. growth at that time. We At that time, we weren't thinking about Arizona and uh, even into New York would have been foreign territory mm -hmm. uh, for us. So uh, it was good to, you know, sort of, and we had, like Dan mentioned earlier, we had those other competitors in the Philly market uh, that were doing a similar concept. So early days, lead generation was that, and that's evolved, obviously, to much more of a digital uh, lead generation. And, you know, we've done some brokers. We have some relationships with brokers that help us find leads. Uh, we've used some portals uh, for helping find leads. Um, the nice thing about now, you know, we're really sort of targeting our leads a little bit more, um, uh, and, and particularly through like a link. LinkedIn um, yep. thing where we can go out and look for what is the profile we're looking for for a franchisee, whether it's net worth, experience, where they live, uh, their uh, you know their profile, and then go after and see if we can't find uh, them specifically, which is a much different than taking out a small classified ad um, like we did you know 15 years ago. And frankly, one thing even when we did take those classified ads out to add to it. Um, I say this jokingly, but there may be a little truth into it. So people would call, and we wouldn't even call them back. Right? <laughs> and uh, they would call again. And by the time they called the third time, we were like, that guy is really hungry. He really wants to do it. Like That's and, how you're qualified. And that was, that was actually like, smart. That, and it, it was <laughs> accidental just because we were busy doing other stuff because, you know, I'm running stores as well. But at the end of the day, it's not the worst case to sort of – this guy got – said – we didn't say no to him, but we just didn't return his call. And he followed up again, and he followed up again. That probably is a good recipe for someone who is uh, driven, because that's really what our business is about. I mean, we make pretzels from scratch, but a big part of our business is to sell pretzels ultimately. And you know, if you somebody felt like they had to call three times to get to buy a franchise, to give us money to buy a franchise, they're probably going to be a better candidate than someone else who just called one time in the middle of the night or something. So. Yeah. I don't want to share too many of my opinions, but it's it's interesting how today's world, you mentioned LinkedIn, there's actually a whole panel, we are just talking about it yesterday, uh, about us doing a case study on that and yada yada, but um, today you can just put some content up and they can be learning all, like this video will live for years, yeah, many sure. years, yeah. this podcast will live for a long time, so that content can be that up front, so it's just funny, like you don't have to call the lead 13 seconds after they submit a form, mm -hmm. like they can listen to some content. Yeah. Um, switching gears again, as we're trying to stay on track and be respectful of your time, um, are there any secrets to how you're um, maintaining really solid franchisee relationships? Because uh, obviously franchisees are the secret sauce, they're out in the field, they're the operators, and you're supporting them, um, but maybe they don't agree with every decision. Um, so are any secrets or tools or tips or tricks as it relates to, to keeping a, a solid franchisee relationship? Well, I'll start with that one. I think the key that we found is measuring it. Right, so mm -hmm. measuring satisfaction, and, and that is something you can go out and do. And we ask the franchisee, we survey our franchisees, how are we doing? And how are we doing in these categories? And there's multiple categories, but just give you a few examples. Marketing, training, mm -hmm. operations, vision, leadership, right? We'll ask very deep questions. And we use a separate company that does this survey, independent company that does the survey for us. They go out and survey all of our franchisees. We, and we ask for detailed answers back on how specifically can we improve and then uh, give us a, a rating on each and every one of these categories so we know where we stand and w right now and then as a company, we have to say how are we gonna improve each and every one of those categories because these are obviously the important categories that the franchisees want us to improve on. Yeah, great advice, listen mm -hmm. and survey. Anything you would add? Yeah, well, a couple things to add to that. So number one is it, we, he listed a lot of those categories out and one specific one that seems to, to follow the pattern of all those and the rating scale is the communication, right? Mm -hmm. it is is the communicate and even getting the surveys back is a part of communication. Um, so things that we do, we have a franchise advisory council, um, yep. in-house franchise advisory council that we have seven members that are voted upon. Um, again, that communication part is key. I have a monthly conference call 
with them and um personal one with just me not recorded no one else from corporate yeah. other than myself on there then we have a monthly conference call everybody's on there and there's nothing that we can't talk about so we have an agenda for the first 45 minutes but the rest of it is just open dialogue open questions and i think the transparency that we may not even have had ourselves you know 10 years ago uh starting out here is to really let people know what's going on so there's no nothing hidden and you feel very forthcoming and i feel like that's the bridge to make the trust because right this is a relationship about trust um and you know if you don't have that there seems to be cracks yep. in the foundation if we don't have that and we strive to do it all the time and you know we're not perfect at it but it's something that we keep focusing on and hopefully keep improving on yeah excellent so i mean that's that's kind of what i've when, whenever i'm talking with you guys and i've known you outside of here not a ton but it's it's something that just oozes from you and and you have that trust that transparency and i think that bleeds over into the culture so could you speak a little about a little to the culture that you have here and kind of how you've fostered it and created it uh well i'll start with that one also again you know i think it starts with dan um and len the two founders of the company and i think you know he mentioned the early days you know the early days investing in people um Quite frankly, I think they probably couldn't afford all the people we hired in the very beginning, right? Remember the early days of startups are very difficult for people. That's why they were sleeping on the sacks. <laughs> yes. Well, I think they were doing okay back then. It's when we started franchising uh, and building all the things. It's actually when the money starts becoming a little yeah. bit more of an issue because you got to invest. Mm -hmm. And they invested and they kept investing and kept investing. And I think that, you know, that's the foundation. Uh, and then we do a lot with the staff. You know, our own staff, I think, understands that, you know, our franchisees, and this is true of all franchise companies, Companies, right? People are investing in you, right? Us as a company, they're investing in a brand, and it's very personal, right? In some cases, and it's not always going to be successful, and it's heartbreaking mm -hmm. when it, it, it doesn't work, uh, but they're investing in you and, and as a company, and sometimes their life savings. Um, and sometimes, you know, they're taking out these loans from 401ks and home equities and, and or going out and getting SBA loans. And that's, you know, can be scary for people. So we all talk about it internally, mm -hmm. how we have to make sure we, we do everything we possibly can to make sure that we've done, uh, you know, we've put our best foot forward. We've given the best possible effort to make or at least help that franchisee become successful. So it starts there with that understanding uh, and then hopefully bringing in the right people um, mm -hmm. to get that. And if they don't, then those people don't work here either any longer. So we, you know, we just continue to sort of foster that. And we talk about it a lot and, and, and work with uh, our internal teams on, 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 that, uh, on that front all, on a regular basis. Yeah, excellent. Anything you'd like to add to the culture? Yeah, I would just say, you know, the, when we're looking for new team members to be a part of it, we're looking for the person, not necessarily the skill. In fact, Marty just had some interviews this past week. And... He's thinking about inter they're interviewing for one job, and we're looking at them. They're just good people, but maybe not qualified for that. Yeah. But if they're a good person and a good fit, I mean, most important is that cultural fit more so than what they do. Because, you know, we could train them to be a good, you know, whether it's marketing or operations yeah. part. Um, but we can't change who they are. And, and that's the most important. And, and once we get people, we try our best to keep good people to maintain here, that we have a good foundation. And, and for the most part, we've been able to do that. And people feel like we're growing still and they, they're a part of it and holding on to the people that have come in here. And I think that's a key part. Looking at the landscape, and thank you for that. That's excellent. Um, looking at the landscape, two last questions. You see any threats out there, whether it's competitors and then also we have the their legal landscape. We were just chatting with Robert Crisanti at IFA and some of the challenges there. But do you see any threats well, listen, there's no doubt that uh, there's challenges out there in the future here for us. I mean, we are in New York, right? And New York just passed their $15 minimum wage. Yep. It's in effect. Um, we're in New Jersey. They passed it. It's not in effect yet. It's going to be there. It's yeah. moving up. Um, and where we are, a lot of our early employees, you know, sometimes um, I was at a restaurant the other day and the girl came up to me, didn't know her. She's like, my 15 years ago, my first job was working for you. Um, and, you know, that's a lot of people. So when you change that dynamic to go pretty quickly to go to $15 an hour from, you know, wages, not that we were ever paying minimum wage, but there's some range in between there. It's a pretty big jump up. So that's obviously a concern for us and dynamic of how being efficient at these stores, um, as well as, you know, fact, cost factors in general, rents going up and all. Those are all things that concern us 
and that we're aware of and looking at what can we do because yeah. we don't want to wait till it happens before we react. Um, you know, our self-serve kiosk, a part of our future plans, yeah, they will be. doesn't mean we're not going to have counter people at our stores, but maybe instead of having two or three counter people working at a store, maybe we'll have one and have a couple of kiosks. We're just thinking long-term so that we don't put the franchisees in a spot where we're reacting to a situation. We're being proactive. Yeah. There was another that just reminded me, we hosted uh, a lady who is a big multi-unit franchisee of uh, Denny's. She owns like 90 of them. Mm. It's pretty impressive. And she was saying that there was an issue with, I forget what it was, but it was about tips. It was about mm. tip laws. And and uh, yeah, there, there's, a lot, um, there's a lot of threats in that realm, but I think that you guys will navigate it just fine. Mm. Um, last question, looking back, uh, Anything that you would do differently uh, for both of you? I want to ask that to both of you. Um, but looking back, um, if you could give advice to yourself now, um, what what would that be, or is there anything? Oh, well, I'll start because mm-hmm. um, that way Dan at the end sounds worse. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so, you know, obviously every day, right, you, you, there's so many things when you look back in your career and you say, wow, I wish I would have done that differently. It's hard to point out specifics. Mm-hmm. I think the big thing would be, you know, relationship stuff. Again, going back to the culture, you know, maybe at some point you brought on the wrong person and you didn't make the decision to get rid of them quick enough or you, uh, or you brought on the right person and you weren't able to keep them. Um, same thing with a franchisee or that the interactions, the small day-to-day interactions you have with franchisees where you maybe could have done something more to help them than you didn't or you, or you, you made a mistake, right? Those things happen on a, on a regular basis. So, I, you know, I think we try to look back and say, let's not make those mistakes again is the number one thing we try to learn from um, and, 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 you know, just continue to grow and continue to evolve and, and, and sort of that's, you know, going back to your early question about the threats even, right? That's the threat that you get complacent, that you don't keep evolving, that you don't keep learning as the franchisor to grow and make sure that you're helping franchisees and people grow, right? It's a people business. And if we're not doing those things every day and continuing to do that every day, that would be a problem. So, you know, if we're looking back, again, just probably saying, you know, did we do enough um, to make sure that we're, you know, we're helping people on a regular basis? Yep. What say you? Uh, I would say, you know, there's nothing specific that I go, wow. I mean, every day I think, you know, hindsight's 2020. You would love to be able to make different decisions. Um, but, you know, do I look at it and say one thing that me and Len are – we're great partners. Yeah, we're best friends and, and great partners. But we have structurally said to ourselves we had originally a store uh, together that we did pretty well off of financially. Mm-hmm. And we kind of used the money for the – corporate this part of the business to keep investing in the franchise part of it in in the structure but have we could we have gone out and gotten money mm. whether it be private equity blown money or anything um, we've chosen not to maybe grow as fast as we could have um, by bringing outside money in okay and that's a thing you lay in night and say what if we would have brought in a bunch of money could we be at a thousand units today right and who knows for us we just heard all the stories and got to talk to you know and this is where ifa and ife and all these events are so great and you know you know talking with lane and and rocco over the years about you know the struggles that you hear from Mm -hmm. other franchisors that grew too fast right and leveraged the company too much and really these are great companies and it's amazing to me when they've told me the story that they were on the verge of bankruptcy before um, at one point because they just grew too fast and just couldn't keep up with it and put themselves in a bad spot. So, But do I look at it and say, could we be somewhere else? But I really wouldn't trade it because I feel like we're in a great position where we are. We're set our path. We have every, I think from a franchisee perspective, we have a department for everybody to cover from training to ops to marketing. Uh, We've grown those without bringing outside capital in. Um, But yeah, do I stay there and say, could we have been a lot bigger? It's in my head. But again, I wouldn't trade it right now. I feel like we're in a secure spot. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for the time. I would add on that that the world is also a little different today and than it was in you know the even the early two thousands um, from a from a capital perspective. But it's been really great to have both of you on. I wish we could spend two more hours and get into all types of stuff. But thank you very much for coming on, and uh, we'll host you again soon. Yeah, it's been great. My pleasure. Thanks thank for having you us, guys. Thank, thank you. you.